final exam, which will be comprehensive. So one test on this exam will come from the second test, okay? Solutions are online. You guys really should have any real great excuse for missing it, okay? So look back over that stuff. And of course, this stuff with the GCD, which was covered on the last test, these ideas are still kind of fundamental to what we're doing with congruences and such. So um, I think it's going to help you build intuition even for this stuff to look back over that. So one, one question will be coming directly from the second exam. Um, the other thing I will tell you is that, um, uh, and, and the problems will be written so that you don't need one, don't worry, um, no calculator on this test, no calculator. I don't want you computing 8,000 digit numbers and such trying to solve these congruence the old fashioned 13 year old way. I don't want that, okay? I want you to be able to do it, and you've, you've seen, I haven't used a calculator in these, and I, you should be able to do all these without a calculator. Really, you should be able to. You can also do it in like six lines of code. Well, that, but that's almost worse, so well, yeah. yeah. But that too. Yeah, true, true, yes, yes, I see your point, yeah, you're right. So, um, so just keep that in mind. You really need to get these techniques down. You need to get them down, okay? Don't think you're gonna cheat by typing in these big numbers on a calculator. You're not, I'm not gonna let you cheat. That's essentially cheating in some sense. You're missing the spirit of this, these sections when you do that. Okay, so um, we're going to do more problems. In fact, this I'm spending, as you know, I mean, some of you maybe are even getting sick of this, but I'm spending tons of time on this stuff now. And I'm going to talk about even more problems today. So this probably more so than any other exam. I mean, I will have really done a lot of stuff for you to help you with this. Okay, so it's just up to you to, to practice and get these things down. You really just need to practice it. Um, but after today, you really should be in very good shape for um, completing the majority of the homework problems. And then anything left um, that you want to ask about, of course, we can, we can clear that up on Tuesday. But we'll definitely be done with the section today. And then Tuesday will be reviewed just like normal. And then we'll, you know, have the exam next Thursday. So um, last thing I want to say, and I, I do apologize for this. This is really my fault. But um, I didn't quite finish up the grading of the homework. I, oh, I thought I was going to get it done, but I didn't. And uh, this one took a long time to grade. Um, a lot of t just numbers are getting big with the congruences and stuff. It takes a while. So um, I will try to have solutions posted, though, before Tuesday. You definitely will get the homework back on Tuesday, for sure. So you'll have it for the exam. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll send out an email to everyone when I have the solutions posted. So if you want to get a head start on looking over some of these for the studying for the exam, um, I'll try to have that done over the weekend or, or maybe tomorrow. Okay. All right. Any questions about the test, just generally speaking? We'll talk more on Tuesday. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so some of you, I already had a couple of people ask about this. and. Um, I know probably still maybe the majority of you haven't really started the homework seriously because you still have a week before it's due, but um, I would suggest you start before Wednesday. I really would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, so this is going to, again, just be a continuation, of course, of 4.4. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is congruences in two variables, and don't worry, we're going to spend some time on the Chinese remainder theorem. We'll, we'll talk about a couple of problems. So not a lot of new stuff. Uh, those of you that have started on the homework, um, number three, if those of you that looked at it, um, I'm guessing maybe a lot of you have no idea where the solution comes from and have no idea what to do with this one. It's actually easy, but you, won't, you don't know that because the book hasn't told you how to do these kind of problems. But I will tell you today. So it's not actually that bad. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do is we're going to, the last thing we're going to talk about is, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this really, but we're going to look at congruences of the following form. <laughs> AX plus BY, now instead of just X we have an X and a Y, congruent to C mod n. Okay, and we're really only going to be interested in a kind of a special case of, of this. I will just tell you in general that um, it's kind of similar to what happens with the one variable congruence. So this has a solution 
only if, i.e. if and only if. Uh, so if you remember in the one variable case, if you forget about the by term, this has a solution if and only if the GCD of A and N divides, well, of course, the C was a B, but A and N divides C. The C in this case is the one sitting on the right-hand side of the congruence. Um, if and only if the GCD of A, B, and N divides C. Okay, of course, now you might say, well, what is this? We haven't talked about the GCD of three numbers. We only talked about the GCD of two numbers, but you can talk about, I mean, it's the same idea, right? It's, it's the largest positive integer that divides all three of them at the same time. Okay. Uh, and in fact, this isn't even really going to come up very much in what we're going to be doing. Um, so what is relevant is this lemma, and the book just sort of states this, and it really is just a special case of what we've already done, but I'm going to pay a little bit more attention and emphasize this a little bit more. Okay. So let's just consider this congruence. AX plus BY congruent to C mod N. Okay. So there are two two things that are relevant. This This is actually going to be useful in doing number three in your homework, which I'm not going to do for you, but I'm going to do the problem. The, the book gave you a problem like number three, and they just sort of said, here's one specific or two specific solutions, but they never told you how to solve it in general. I'm going to solve that in general. And then that idea, you just do the same thing with number three. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing is that if the GCD of A and N equals 1 then the congruence has a unique solution it is a little more complicated in this case though um, So let me just be clear here. In X, for every um, value of Y. Okay, and the second part is that if the GCD of B and N, it's the same kind of idea here. If the GCD of B and N is equal to 1, then the congruence has a unique solution in Y for every value of X. So here's what I'm going to do. Part B is the same, and this is very, very short. It just uses what we already know. We'll talk about part A. Yes? Maybe it's just the wording, but I'm not quite clear what you mean by solution in X and in Y. So I, okay, replace in with 4. Okay, so what, what I mean is plug any number you want in for Y. Then there is a unique solution for X corresponding to that value of y, modulo n, modulo n. So for example, if I plug in 10 for y, then this congruence here has exactly one solution for x mod n. And that's true for any value of y I plug in. So if I plug in 50 for y, there's a unique solution for x. Plug in 1,000 for y, unique solution for x. Okay? So let's suppose that the GCD of A and N is equal to 1. 
And so um, we're just going to let y be arbitrary. Okay, so I'm going to be, again, a little bit informal here because I want, to sp I want to spend the time on problems. So here's the way to think about it, okay? And those of you that took Calc, maybe Calc 2 or Calc 3 where you had double and triple integrals um, or partial derivatives, right? The partial derivative of, um, with respect to x, you treat y as a constant, right? Then you differentiate, you'd imagine y is like 6 and then you just differentiate with respect to x. Well, most of you probably remember this. It's the same kind of idea. Just imagine that y is just some number that you don't know. If it makes it easier, imagine y is 10 right now and everything I'm about to say. Okay, just imagine it is a fixed number. So what we're going to do is um, just note that ax plus by congruent to c mod n um, okay, forgive the notation here and not writing this out, but I just want to squeeze this in. If and only if, right, we can we can subtract, we can add and subtract from both sides and it preserves the congruence. There's no problem with that. If and only if AX is congruent to C minus BY mod N. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to think about, and this will make, should make sense if you follow what we've done before. Ima again, Im imagine that, of course, A, B, and C are just constants given to you in the beginning of the problem. These are, these are numbers, okay? And imagine that y is also just another number you don't know. Well, then this is just a number, right? So this is just like now we're in the realm of what we've already been talking about now, right? 5x is congruent to 20 mod 30, right? We've done things like this before. So if you think of it this way now, now we're in the realm of things that we've already studied, okay? So now how would we solve this? And again, what I want you to do in your mind is imagine this is a number, this is a number. All right. So what is it we do first? We check the GCD of A and N and see if it divides B. My B is this entire thing right now, right? You guys remember what we, what we did before? It's the same question now. It's just we do the same thing we did before. Well, um, the GCD of, and it's a simple, the GCD of A and N is assumed to be 1, right? And so, of course, it divides, right? That's what we always check, right? We check the GCD. We ask ourselves, does it divide B? This is B now. And it does because it's 1. 1 divides everything. How many solutions are there? The number of solutions is the equal to the GCD, which is 1. So there's a unique solution. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's nothing deeper than what we've already done. in whatever word makes more sense to you for x, right, modulo n. That's all I'm going to say. B is the same. It's the same thing. It's just now you, you've got B, and so you're just going to subtract the um, ax over to the other side, and then it's the same argument. It's exactly the same argument. And this is the only case that the book really focuses on, and so this is for the sake of time, the only thing I'm really going to worry about, too, is um, just the class of congruences for which one of these two conditions holds. And when one of these two conditions holds, as you'll see in a second, it is really just a problem like we've done before. It just looks harder, but it's not, really. It, it really is just the same thing. Okay. We okay with this? Okay, so uh, like I said, I'm not going to do number three. Number three involves congruences like this. I'm going to do the problem that the book talks about, although they don't actually tell you how to solve it, which is kind of weird. I don't know why they did that. They give you this problem, and they could have easily just solved the whole thing, but they didn't. I don't, I don't know why he did that. But anyways, um, so let me do an example. And I really want, again, of course, I'm going to encourage you to pay attention to this because um, problem three is you're going to do the same thing. And by the way, the the... 
book solution to problem three um, is one way of expressing the solution. is not the only way to express the solution. Um, and maybe in linear algebra, you, you maybe you remember that there's actually often multiple ways to express the same solution. Um, so I'm going to give so if you do it the number three the way I'm going to do this example, you were going to get something different than what the book says, but it's the same. It, it's equivalent. It's the same solution, really. Okay, so let's see. Um, I hope I brought. Okay, yeah. So let's do this. Let's do this problem. Um, solve the congruence 7x plus 4y congruent to 5 mod 12. Okay. So here's what you're going to do. Now, the same rules apply here in the sense that we're only interested in solutions that are uh, modulo 12. We don't care about finding all possible integers that, that satisfy this. We were interested in that with the Diophantine equation that I, that I did for you um, on, on Tuesday. We actually wanted to find all of them. That's where that parameter t came into play. But here we don't care about that. Okay, So we, we really only care about finding solutions that are between 0 and 11, for example. Okay. So um, here's what you're going to do. So first, this is just, again, this is just one way of going about it. Note that 7x plus 4y is congruent to 5 <coughs> mod 12. Again, this is kind of like what we did in the, in the, the proof. Um, of the lemma, if and only if, 7x is congruent to 5 minus 4y mod 12. Okay. Now, this satisfies the first condition of the previous lemma, right? So, um, the GCD, so my a in this case is 7, my n is 12 relative to the notation in the last lemma that I just gave you, the GCD of 7 and 12 is 1. They're relatively prime, right? So since the GCD of 7 and 12 equals 1, this congruence has a unique solution in X for each integer Y. Okay. That's just from the last lemma. And so here's, here's the way I'm going to present the solution. What you're going to do is, is just what I, kind of what I alluded to in, in the explanation of the proof of the last lemma. It's just you're just going to let y be arbitrary. And you're just going to imagine it's some number you don't know. Imagine it's a constant. Don't imagine it's a variable. Imagine it is a constant. And then solve it, this congruence, just like we did on Tuesday. That's, exact, that's all you're doing here. That's it. Okay? So I'm just going to write it this way. Okay, so let's just let y and z um, be arbitrary. For now, we th don't really care what it is for now. You might say, oh, wasn't well, it just between 0 and 11? Well, yes, we're going to get to that later. But for now, it's just, it's just going to be an integer, and we'll, we'll figure out how to solve this. OK, so and now the technique is, is nothing more than what we've already, already done. So. 7x congruent to 5 minus 4y mod 12. So what is it that we want to try to do? Well, what we want to do, if possible, is, and in fact, you can always do this. You can all, I'm going to be very clear on this. If 
this number is relatively prime to this number. You can always find something to multiply both sides by so that this coefficient becomes 1. Always. Okay? You might want to write that down. If they're relatively prime, you don't have to, but, you know, this and this are relatively prime. You can always multiply by something to get 1. Modulo. The modulus, of course, is what I mean. I don't mean one seventh, of course. I mean an integer. So that modulo, you get you get one. Okay. So let's just, and I'm going to do this longer. I mean, this is going to be a little longer than necessary, but let's just kind of think about this. Okay. Well, one. Okay. So seven can't be reduced anymore. Mod mod twelve. Of course, you can write it as minus five, but that's not one. So let's let's see where we can go with this. Well, um, if you multiply with both sides by two, you get fourteen. Well, that's two mod twelve. So that's not quite what we want, right? If you multiply by three, you get twenty-one. Okay. Still, even if you use negatives, you're not going to really be able to get a 1 that way. Um, if you multiply by 4, same thing, 24, you're going to get 28. That's 4 mod 12 or minus 8 mod 12. Still, we're not getting 1. What about 5? Okay, 35 is minus 1 mod 12, right? Because 12, 24, 36, subtract 1 down to get to, to 35. And that's really all we care about. Because once we've got the minus 1, we'll just multiply both sides by minus 1. We can shift the negative on the other side then we're done. It's easy. It's really not that hard. It isn't. Okay? And we're not done right away, but we have to do a couple of things. Yeah? And I understand what you're trying to say, but it's, that it's easy. But some mm -hmm. of us are not exactly fast at basic arithmetic. Well... And to get up to 5, <laughs> testing all those, what if it wasn't 5? What if it turned out to be 11 and we started at 0? Um, that's too bad. But, I, I mean... Wow. Uh, I'm, there's, I mean, it's uh, this. Okay, this sounds a little bit cold, but I mean, it's sort of like you know. Well, it kind of sucks that there are lots of diseases out there and you have to suffer, but you just do. I mean, that's just the way it goes. So you know, I mean, but but no, re really though. I mean, this this really should still even finding the, the appropriate number really shouldn't take more than than five minutes. Really, I mean, these, these problems. But he, he's saying in general, if the numbers are bigger, you know, um, yeah, but, but really all the ones that we've done so far, you know, and all the, pro and I'm going to do some more, you really can, that really isn't happening, really. Um, and I'm going I'm to talk about a couple more problems even. This, this, I know, I understand your concern, but I don't think that really that's going to happen, this homework, okay? Okay, so did everybody see what I did? I just multiplied through by five, right? Okay, now, I, I want to be, let me be very clear here, though. There's something I want to say. In general, notice this is an if and only if. So, the, the, in general, only one implication holds. If you have A congruent to B mod N, then AC is congruent to BC mod N. If AC is congruent to BC mod N, remember, you can't always cancel the C, but you can if it's relatively prime to the modulus. I multiplied by 5 here. I can go back the other way because 5 and 12 are relatively prime. That is an important thing to notice, though. It's not always if and only if by multiplying. No. Multiplying, you can always multiply to go this way. You can cancel to go backwards only if what you're canceling is relatively prime to n. You guys clear on this? This is a subtle point, but it's important. That's why I can say if and only if, because it's relatively prime. Okay? So what's 30? Yes, Carrie. Why was, why was, I didn't know it was 35. No. Why? I'm getting to it. 35 is minus 1. I'm just writing all the steps down. No, 35 Oh, oh, yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> that is definitely a typo. Sorry, okay, oh, great, now I'm going to... There we go. How's that? Okay. Okay, so, yes, thank you. Um, okay, so this is 35 is the same thing as minus 1 mod 12, right? Because, again... Um, so if, if anyone's not sure about this, about where I'm getting the minus 1, if you're, you can go two different ways, right? So 35 um, is, has a remainder of 11 mod 12. Right? 35 is also 11 mod 12. Um, but 11 and minus 1 are the same thing. And the way to think about this is, I mean, there's, there's yeah, I mean, you can think of it a couple of different ways. But... Um, if you have to go up to get to, the, to a multiple, then that becomes negative, right? So you have to go up by 1 to get to 36, it's, it's negative, okay? So that's, that's one way. But again, if, you, if you're not sure, just, just think about um, 
35 is minus 1 mod 12. Just think about the definition. What does it mean? 35 minus minus 1 is divisible by 12, which it is, 36. Okay. Um, so this is minus 1 congruent to 5 times 5 minus 4y mod 12. Okay, well, we can multiply through by minus 1 on both sides. Yes, sorry, yep, I keep doing this. What is wrong with me? Okay, sorry. So I can multiply through by minus 1 on both sides to get x congruent to minus 5 times 5 minus 4y, right? Mod 12. Almost done. Okay, so now the question is, uh, what is minus 25 mod 12? Okay, here's the way you want to think about it, okay? Um, this would, I, could, I could explain this a lot better if you had abstract algebra, but um, <laughs> really what you're doing is this. The negative tw of 25 is, well, think, think about, all right, think about just regular numbers. My, well, what's the negative of a, of a number? It's the number you have to add to get zero. Okay? It's the number you have to add to get zero. So how do I get zero? What do I have to add to 25 to get zero mod 12? I have to add 11, right? Add 11 to 25 because you get 36, which is zero mod 12 because 12 divides into it. So minus 25 is 11 modulo 12. Okay? So this is 11 plus and 20 is positive. So what's 20 mod 12? Okay, I hope you guys are getting, if you, if you don't know what that is right away, you're in trouble. You need to start on the homework tonight. Okay? <laughs> Eight. Thank you. Okay, now we're done. That's it. I mean, I have to write the solution out, but that's that's the work. That's it. That's all you have to do. Yeah. So here's how I do it. Mm -hmm. 20 mm -hmm. minus 12 gives me an 8. Mm -hmm. And then I could minus again if I wanted to get... Sure. You can keep going down as many times as you want to. Yeah. So if I'm starting from like 35 mm -hmm. minus 12 each time... Mm -hmm. Until you get to something out, smaller than 12. Until I find out what it is, that yeah. makes a lot more. It does, but so I mean, what you, what you do though is just think about. I mean, really, all this is 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 third grade long division. Take a big number divided by twelve. Just do the long division. And what your remainder is? That's what, that's it. That's what, you don't want to keep subtracting fifty thousand times. Just just do the division like you learned when you were eight. The remainder is 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 it? That's it. Okay. Okay. So now, how do I? Okay. So this is. I guess this is an important point I want to gloss over. So how do I write the solution? Well, this is one way to do it. Okay, now, we, we came, came across this before. If, uh, just suppose instead of 11 plus 8y, just um, so this isn't as, as abstract, suppose, on, suppose this was just the number 7. What's the canonical solution here? x is 7, right? Because then 7 minus 7 is 0, divisible by 12. So your canonical solution is x is 11 plus 8y, because when you subtract off the right side, you get 0, divisible by 12. You see that? That's it. That's all there is to it. Now, the, now, how do you write y? Well, if you're, and I think you've, all of you have taken linear algebra or calculus, you've dealt with parameters. y can be whatever you want. So we're just going to let y be t, and then x is going to be 11 plus 8t. That's it. You're done. You solve it. This, this, in some sense, this is no harder than the other problems. It's the same. It's just that now you have a y that you just don't know. But it, it's solved exactly the same way. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, well, remember, y was arbitrary, right? So we're going to say, well, y, we'll, we'll, we'll let just, you know, y is just going to be t mod 12. And x then is going to be, since y is t, uh, crap, okay, sorry, 11 plus 8t mod 12. Yes? Uh, it seems like uh, we could have 
gone the other way and mm -hmm. had yes. the, yes. You know, had you could have. the other parameter. Can we be, or is it good well, for us to be strategic about uh, okay, well, basically so the same problem? So you have, actually, you have to be careful here, though, because 7 and 12 are um, relatively prime, but 4 and 12 are not. Okay. And so I, in general, yes, you can. If, the, if it's relatively prime, you can just do everything the, the, the symmetric way. But in this case, it's important to choose the 7, because otherwise you can't apply the theorem, because 4 and 12 aren't relatively prime. Yeah. Since we're, in a sense, solving for x, we do put it at you know, y compared to that, thus x equals 11 plus 18, and not include that mod 12? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm just asking. no. So x. Is um, okay. So you okay? Yeah. Here's. I, I think this is kind of similar to the question you asked after class on Tuesday. Okay. So the point is that all we care about is is we just all we care about are solutions mod twelve, and the reason is because once you have a solutions mod twelve, then you automatically get all the solutions because you just add a multiple of twelve to any multiple of twelve to them. So. Um, you know, really, if you, you wanted the, the general solution here, then you would just add a plus, you know, just kind of like when you're solving sine x equals 1, you got something plus 2 n pi or whatever. It's the same thing here. It's sort of periodic in some sense. Right. So, with, but if I would have said, so my solution then is x equals 11 plus 18 and just left that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, really what you want, you want the mod 12 because the mod 12 sort of, in some sense sort of captures all the solutions. What you're saying, because, yeah, because you're saying really now it's everything that, of this form mod 12. Um, suppose at some point we had divided through um, and our mod number went down. I believe that that would still capture all the solutions. Do we need to, like, up well, I will. Okay, now I will. I will. Say, I will just say this because this is just an easy, easy. It's sort of a cop out answer, but that's just simply not going to happen here because the problems that you're going to be dealing with, one of these guys is going to be. They're going to be relatively prime, so you're really not going to be able to divide through by anything. Cool. In this case. Okay. Yes. So the second, your last step was just to simplify your second to the last step, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Sure, you could have. Okay. You could have. I, I would prefer that you reduce everything down to the small. So if you have something, you know, anything mod 12, I'd like the numbers to be smaller than 12. Uh, just because then it's easy for me to know if you're right. If you write 50 billion and 9, then I have to divide it out, and it's just record, just a lot more work. So I would like you to reduce everything as small as, small as you can. Okay. Um, so this is it. Now, you might, okay, I'm going to spend too much time on this, but you can, you, you can look at this and, and see if, you can actually check a couple of values to see if this is right. So, for example, suppose I choose um, t to be 0, then x is going to be 11, and let's see if that actually works, right? So if I choose t to be 0, then y is 0 and x is 11, plug in 0 for y and 11 for x, you get 77 congruent to 5 mod 12, so that reduces to just seven, 12 dividing 72, which it does. That's, that's right. Okay, and so, you know, similarly, if you plug in, we'll just, I'll just say this, but 1 for t, y is 1, then what's x? 7 mod 12, right? So, uh, what do you get? 53, this becomes 53, 48, when you subtract 5, 12 divides that. And in fact, you can generate every solution mod 12 with this parametric solution. That gives you everything. Okay, is this okay? It's not, it's not that bad. It's not. It really is not that hard. You can do number three just by doing exactly what I did here. So we're okay with this? Yes? Yes? Um, I understand in this case we're only concerned with solutions mod 12. If that wasn't the modifier, would there be others we have to worry about? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, depending on how the problem was, was given. I mean, the the... The, I think the author does a decent job. The, the, the problem with the Diophantine equation is saying, you know, find all solutions to 5x plus 7y equals 20 or something like that where there's no modulus. In that case, you really are looking to find, to express everything. Um, these problems, all of the congruences that have a, mod, a modulus in them, you are only worried about finding the solutions modulo that modulus, and that, that's all you have to worry about. But you can get all the solutions um, regardless just by adding any multiple of 12 to your solutions, okay? So for example, I mean, just imagine you have a solution for x. Well, suppose you replace x with x plus 12. Well, the 12 is 0, so you really haven't changed any. When you, when you reduce mod 12, you haven't changed it at all, you know, right? It's just, just like taking the sine of 0, the sine of 2 pi. It's a, you, you end up at the same spot, 
right? I mean, 12 and 24, 36, these are all identified mod 12. So, um, yeah, is that okay? Okay, all right. I, I'm glad you guys are asking questions. I want to move on just so we'll make sure that we get through everything else here. But, well, if you, if you don't want to, that's fine, but you're going to miss out on, on, on some stuff that I think will be helpful. But um, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, if you saw my notes, actually, look how, look how neat this is. I told you. Yeah, I, I, have, I have about the neatest handwriting you're ever going to see, except on here I can't, I can't do it. I know. I wish I could. I wish I could, but I can't. Okay, um, so let's, let's go ahead and move on here. Uh, what do I want to do? Um, okay, here's what I want to do. Another example. Yeah. Example two. Okay, so we finished off with the Chinese remainder theorem before. Um, let's actually go through a specific problem using the Chinese remainder theorem. It's actually, this is one that's in the book. Um, X is congruent to... 2 mod 3, x is congruent to 3 mod 5, and x is congruent to 2 mod 7. Okay, so really in this case, what I want to do is use the Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, so this, unfortunately, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to have time to go back and rewrite the theorem because it's going to take too long. It's kind of long and messy. But mm, so the Chinese guys did this a long time ago. There's the history. Um, that's all I know. I, I don't know anything else other than that. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, in, I'm not going to go into that. But. Uh, actually, it didn't. Use, now it's cool. Now it didn't used to be. Um, okay, so here's what we're gonna do. B basically, and I'm just gonna have to do this for the sake of time. You go back through your notes and look. The, the statement of the, of the Chinese remainder theorem was x is congruent to a1 mod n1, x is congruent to a2 mod n2, on all the way down. So I'm just gonna identify those in the solution to um, this system of congruences that the Chinese remainder theorem gives us. Okay, so if you remember, it was a1, n1, x1 plus a2, capital N2, x2 plus a3, capital N3, x3. We're just going to identify those. I mean, it's just going to be following the, the, the algorithm. That's all we're going to do here. Okay, so in this case, uh, what we have is n1 is 3, right? n2 is 5, n3 is 7. Okay, hopefully you guys know what I mean, just relative to the, what I've set up when I actually gave you the Chinese remainder theorem, right, the moduli. Okay, so of course to solve this, you, you, if you're going to apply the Chinese remainder theorem, first you should check to see that the hypotheses are satisfied, right? One thing we need is that there's no coefficient other than one in front of the x, right? If we have something else, we can't immediately apply the, the Chinese remainder theorem. It's only stated when you have one coefficients, right, on the left side. The other thing you have to check is that pairwise the moduli are relatively prime. Three and five, three and seven, five and seven, and they are relatively prime. You have to check, you should check these first, okay? So, um, also, A1 is 2, A2 is 3, and A3 is 2, right? You guys all with me so far? Okay, if you look back in your notes, it's just, okay. Um, okay, now, remember the last, uh, well, no, the second to last thing we need are these capital Ns, right? Capital N1, capital N2, capital N3, and remember, this is actually really easy. Um, whatever index you're on or subscript you're on, it's just the product of the moduli of different um, index than what you're at. So n sub 1 is the product of the second and the third modulus. So it's 35, right? Capital n sub 2 then is the product of the first and the third. So that's 21. And capital n sub 3 is the product of the first and second, which is 15. Right? So there's only one other thing we have to find, and we have to solve. The, there are three congruences we have to solve. These are actually very, very simple congruences. They're not going to take long. And once we've got the solutions, then we just write everything out and we're done. Okay. Okay. So the first one is capital N1 X1. 
congruent to 1 modulo the first modulus given in the system, mod 3. Again, this is all given to you also in the statement or in the, in the, proof, the sketch of the proof that I did on Tuesday. Okay, so, well, we know what capital N1 is, it's 35. 35 x1 congruent to 1 mod 3. Okay, so, what is, and there's a couple of reasonable answers here. Um, what's 35 mod 3? Minus 1, right? And that's also 2, right? So again, if you think of it just from the definition, what is, what is any number modulo, whatever the modulus is? It's the remainder upon division by that modulus. What's the remainder when you divide 35 by 3? Right, 3 times 11 is 33, remainder of 2. Okay. Also, if you go down from 36, it's minus 1. And that's going to be the most convenient way to write this now, is minus 1. So we'll just write this as minus x1 is congruent to 1. I'm going to run out of, well, no, I can get this in. Okay, mod 3. Okay. And if we multiply both sides by minus 1, we get x1 is congruent to Minus one. I'm just. I'm doing. I'm writing out all the steps here, just so hopefully I don't lose anyone. And again, as we said, right? What's minus one mod three? Okay. And if you're really struggling on this, if anyone's just not asking me and saying, "How's he getting the minus one? How's he do this?" Well, it's got to be one of three things. It's either zero, one, or two mod three. Is minus one zero mod three? In other words, does three divide minus one? No. Is minus three is minus one congruent to one mod three? In other words, does three divide minus one minus one, which is minus two? No. You can figure it out. I mean, it's it's not that bad. Just use the definition. If you're having trouble with intuition, just use the definition. You'll you'll get it down. You will get it down. Okay. So we've got x one now, right? So I'll box this in. So we, we can just take x one to be two. Okay, and I might not go through the details of all of these congruences, but the next one is n2, x2, congruent to um, 1 mod 5. Remember from, this, from the sketch of the proof, it's always congruent to 1. All these congruences are congruent to 1 mod whatever it, whatever it happens to be. Okay, um, so again, remember n2 was, what, 21? 21 x2 congruent to 1 mod 5. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all this other than just to say, okay, well, what is 21 mod 5? What's the remainder when you divide 21 by 5? 1. You guys should all be getting this. I hope you guys are all getting this. 1. It's, it's not hard. So 21 is 1, so we can just take x2 to be 1. We're done. Right? Okay, and the third one, n3, x3, congruent to 1, mod 7. Okay, so again, n3 is 15, so 15, x3, congruent to 1, mod 7. What is 15, mod 7? So we can also take x3 to be equal to 1 as well, right? Okay. Okay. So here's uh, the actual solution. Then, using the, again the notation that I set up for you, um, x bar is uh, a one capital n one x one plus a two capital n two x two plus a three capital n three x three. And I'm going to, you can all do this, of course. We already have, we have all these now. We have all the numbers. They're staring at you on the screen. You just plug them all in, okay? So you're going to get 233. Okay, now the last thing that you want to do is um, you're expressing it. So the last part of the Chinese remainder theorem says that the solution is unique modulo the product of all the moduli. So what we're really doing now is we're interested in the solution modulo, I'll write this out for you, 105, which is 3 times 5 times 7. So really what we want to do is we want to reduce modulo, the product of the moduli. 
And so 233 is actually the same thing as 23 mod 3 times 5 times 7, which is, of course, 105. So there's your, there's your really how you want to write your solution. You would say the solution to this congruence is, is 23 mod 105. There's your solution. Or x is congruent to 23 mod 105. Yes? When you say that x sub 1 is 2 and x sub 2 is 105, are you, are you really saying that x sub 1 can be 2? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. So, but that statement is still valid even? Because it seems like that statement is insinuating that it has to be 2, but it can't. Uh, It'd be like five. Uh, uh, yes, it doesn't actually have to be two, um, but I'm always just going to take the solution, the smallest value that I can. So the reason why I'm taking it to be two is just that it's the smallest and it's just easier to work with smaller numbers. But is that really mathematically accurate? No, I'm, I'm just saying when I say x1 equals two, I'm not saying that x1 must be two. I'm just saying x1 equals two is a solution to this congruence. And it is the unique solution to the congruence modulo three. So it's not, and so there's this distinction between is it the unique integer that satisfies the congruence or is it the unique integer mod 3 that satisfies the congruence? Of course, it is not the unique integer that satisfies this congruence because, as you said, 5 will work, 8 will work. There's an infinite number of integers that will work. This solution, this, there, it is not the case that there is a unique integer x1 that satisfies this. That is not true. But modulo 3, there is a unique one. In other words, any, solu any two solutions are the same mod 3. Okay, so when I write x1 equals, that does not imply that it's unique. It's not, there's no logical contradiction here. It's just that it is a solution that works. And all we care about is getting one of them. That's all we care about. Um, so again, remember, right, in this case, the coefficient here is 1. 1 and 3 are relatively prime, so this has a unique solution, mod 3. This has a unique solution, mod 5. This has a unique solution, mod 7. Okay. Are we okay with this? Then you write your final solution with these Chinese remainder theorem problems modulo the product of the moduli when the Chinese remainder theorem applies. That's how you want to express your solution. And again, I would prefer you reduce it down as small as possible so that it's actually a number smaller than the modulus. Are we okay with this? Okay. Um, let's see, so there's, what else do I, I want to say something um, about, there's another problem here, uh, yes, okay, it's 4D, 4D, does everybody have this down? We okay with this? Okay, um, all right, so I'm not going to do the whole problem for you, but this, this is one I want to call your attention to, 4D asks you to solve The system, um, okay, 2x congruent to 1 mod 5. I'm just going to write it vertically here. So 3x <laughs> congruent to 9 mod 6. Um, 4x congruent to... 1 mod 7 and 5x congruent to 9 mod 11. Okay. Why didn't you reduce that second one? Uh, because they're trying to make you do it. Um, <laughs> you could actually ask the same kind of question really about, uh, about all of these in some sense. Um, okay. I think I copied this right. So, question. I want you, I want, this is not a trick question. Can I directly apply the Chinese remainder theorem to this? Why? The coefficients are not all one. Okay? I would expect all of you to see that. Okay? That, so, you, you cannot do that. Now, um, are the moduli pairwise relatively prime? If I take any two of them, are they relatively prime? Yes. The moduli are okay. We're fine with that. So what is it that I need to, to worry about? Well, uh, how can I remedy this? You might say, oh, well, it sucks. This is going to be too hard. I can't do it. I hate it. I'm not going to do it. Well, it's not that bad. What's the, t what's the trick? Multiply through it so that you can get the coefficients to become one. That's it. Then you can apply the Chinese remainder theorem, and you're done. Okay? So 
I'm not going to do all of these, but you know, you have the idea now. So, okay. So let's let's look at the first congruence. 2x congruent to 1 mod 5, okay? <laughs> so, what I want, so you're all with me here, what we want is to get the coefficients in front of x to become 1. Um, so, what can I do with this first one? Okay, so, I, yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to stay with positive values because I think it'll just be easier. Multiply 3 by 3, right? 6 is 1, mod 5. Done. Okay? I mean, there's nothing wrong with what you, with what you said. I'm just going to do it this way. So if you multiply 3 by 3, you get 6x is congruent to 3, mod 5. And again, I, I want to be clear on this. The reason why I can use this if and only if arrow is because 3 and 5 are relatively prime. If, if I multiplied through by 10, I'd, I'd have to erase this part of the arrow. In general, you have to. But you can go both ways because it's relatively prime to the modulus. So it's equivalent. Um, and then, of course, at this point, we just reduce. And this is just the same thing as x congruent to 3 mod 5. OK, so now I've got the 1 that I want. And so I can replace, let's say if I call this 1 prime, I really can replace 1 with 1 prime because they have the same solution set. It's the same thing. OK, now this is maybe a little bit trickier. And I'm going to stop at this point with this one. But how do I deal with this one? So 3x congruent to 9 mod 6. I will tell you something right now. You cannot multiply through by something to get a 1 in front of the x. You can't do it. And actually, the reason for this is because 3 and 6 are not relatively prime. And in fact, this is an if and only if. If, if those two numbers are not relatively prime, you cannot multiply through to get a 1. You can't. OK? so. You can multiply through to get a 1 if and only if the two guys are relatively prime. Yes. Yes. You can divide by 3. And then, luckily, when we divide by 3, we get a 2. And we still have all four of the moduli uh, pairwise relatively prime. If you divide it through and you got a 5, then you're, then you're it's still in trouble. So you have to divide through by everything. 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 So remember, there are lots of techniques that we've learned. One thing that you can do, and this preserves, this is an if and only if. If you have a number that divides all three of the numbers, you can divide everything through by it, including the modulus. And you have the same set of solutions. OK, so I'm not going to write that. But what I'm doing is, as she said, we're just dividing through by 3 everywhere. Everywhere now. So this is infinite only if x is congruent to 3 mod 2. So there is now my second one, and we're good because we have a coefficient of 1. And again, even though we changed the modulus, all of the moduli are, we're not going to end up having to change the modulus for 7 and 11 because 4 and 7 are relatively prime. 5 and 11 are relatively prime. And remember what I said, that means you can always multiply through to get a 1 when they're relatively prime. What do we multiply 4 by? Well, um, 2, right? Multiply through by 2, you're done. What about 5? Well, if you, okay, so um, if you, so yeah, there's a couple of ways that you can, you can think about this. I'm actually just going to leave this to you to do. I'm not going to go through it, okay? Um, but that's what you do. That's what you do here. And then once you've got it, then the hypotheses of the Chinese Romanian theorem are satisfied. Then you can solve it just like I did the last problem. Okay. I'm too old. I'm not allowed to do that. I'm too old to say that. No, I would, I would feel really weird if I started saying that. Um, you can do it for me if you want to, but I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, yes? Um, earlier, like a couple of sentences ago, mm -hmm. you were saying, like, when I said, could you divide by three? Mm -hmm. Then you're like, yeah, because you get two, but if you had five, then you, is it? all the mods have to be different? Yes, yes. I mean, so, yeah, they definitely do. And you want the, the um, any two of them need to be uh, relatively prime. So, for example, if you had the same one, so for example, 10 and 10, they're not relatively prime because right. 10 divides both of them. Okay. So, yeah, you definitely need them to be different. And you want, if you pick any two, the GCD should be one. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. And if, we, if that did happen, then we'd be kind of posed in general, right? We can't, like... 
find a way to sneak around in. Oh uh, well. Does that mean that there's not a a, a mutually incongruent solution? It could be multiple. It depends. Well, it all depends on what the problem the problem is. I mean, it's certainly possible that they can be solvable at the same time. Um, but they, it's also possible that they will be. It all depends. But I don't. That's that really shouldn't come up. Though. I'm just wondering, you know, if, if that happens, you don't just like go back and try to go a different way so that doesn't happen anymore. That means something about. It, it means, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're, it all. It, but yeah, I mean, it all depends. I mean, this really should not happen to you. Um, so I mean, you know, for let's see if I can. I mean. I don't think I want to spend the time on this. I mean, I can give you exa I can give you examples where the system has solutions. I can give you an example where it doesn't have any at all. But um, no, this this really shouldn't come up in this with in the homework. So that's not really something you really need to worry about. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. And then it's going to be recorded forever. And, and then, yeah, I don't know. And I don't think. I, oh, I've done. Oh, believe me. I, I sh I have done a lot of embarrassing stuff. In fact, I do a lot of stuff that you probably would not ever guess that I would have done, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But um, okay, so let's see what else. What else do you want to do here? Um, oh yeah, okay. This is a lot. This is probably the last thing I'm going to have time to talk about. But um, let's see. Let's talk about number six. Okay, this is one. Of, now, now you have a, a few other homework problems that are sort of outside the box type problems. This is this is one of them. Um, number six says find the. Oops, sorry. Okay, find the smallest. Integer. A bigger than two, such that okay. Um, let me. All right, I gotta find this. Let's see. Okay. So there are a bunch of conditions here. So two divides a, three divides a plus one. Yes. Um, they just forgot the other one, yeah. No. Five divides a plus three. Six divides a plus four. Okay. Now, okay. Um, now, this, this, you know, at first glance, you might think, oh, well, this is just some weird problem that they're just throwing me out of nowhere, and I'm just going to just hammer on it and just not use anything I've already known. No, 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 no. Your, your, your default should be, I need to translate this into a congruence problem. That's what you should be thinking. Okay? And that's exactly what we're going to do. And then we're just going to, in fact, this is going to end up being a Chinese remainder theorem problem. That's all it's going to be, really. When, I, when the smoke clears, that's what this is going to turn into. Okay, so... Um, the correspond okay. I'm, I'm going to do this kind of slowly here. This corresponding congruences, and of course, this is again why I'm spending so much time on this section because um, maybe you wouldn't think to do this. What, two divides a, then that's just another way of um, of saying that a is congruent to zero mod two. 3 divides a plus 1, I'm going to, okay, like I said, so this is, and I want you to think about this, it's not that a is congruent to 1 mod 3, that's not right, a is congruent to minus 1 mod 3, right? Think about what the congruence symbol means, it, this, this is the same thing as saying, asserting that 3 divides a minus minus 1, which is a plus 1, that's why you have the minus 1 there. You guys seeing this? Just think, just go back to the definition of congruence and you'll know if you got it right or not. Okay? And then the next one then is what's the next congruence? Minus 2 mod 4. And the last two then, of course, then will be A is congruent to minus 3 
mod 5 and a is congruent to minus 4 mod 6. Okay, well, here's what I'm going to do, and, and this actually will make sense once you see where we're going with this. Um, let's get rid of the negatives. Okay, let's replace them with, with, with positive values here. So this is the same thing as a is congruent to zero. Of course, we don't have to do anything with the first one. a is congruent to 0 mod 2. a is congruent to, what's the second one become? 2, right? Mod 3. And again, remember what I said about how to think about the negatives. Negative 1, you're thinking, what do I have to add to 1 to get a multiple of 3? 2. You have to add 2 to 1 to get a multiple of 3, right? You get 3 times 1. What does the next one become? What's minus 2, whoops, sorry. What's minus 2 mod 4? What do I have to add two, to 2 to get 4? 2, right? What's minus 3 mod 5? What's minus 4 mod 6? Mod 6, sorry. Okay. Well, now, um, so first question is, okay, well now the A sort of serves as the X in this case. Um, can I use the Chinese remainder theorem right away to solve this? I mean, and when I say right away, I mean, can we just go right into it immediately? No, why? They're not all relatively prime. Two and four, right, are not relatively prime. In other words, the GCD is not one. Two is the GCD of two and four. I cannot just immediately apply the Chinese remainder theorem here. Here's what I want to do. I want to, and this is what's going to happen. And so in cases like this, you might say, okay, well, how do I do this? Solving all these congruences, okay, well, I have an A, i.e. an X, same thing. Um, so it kind of fits the form of the Chinese remainder theorem. So your gut instinct should be, I should be able to use it somehow. I just have to do something first. So what we really would like is to have these redundancies, the ones that aren't relatively prime, have a couple of those congruence implied by the rest so we can just throw them away. Okay, so think about this for a second. If A is congruent to 2 mod 4, well think about the possibilities for A, right? A could be 2, A could be 6, right? A could be 10, all of these are divisible by 2. So but the fact that A is congruent to 2 mod 4 implies that A is congruent to 0 mod 2, so we don't need it. It's redundant. We don't need it. You, are you guys getting what I'm saying here? We can throw it away. We can throw it away because it's implied by the, by the, by the rest of them. And we can do that, and I'll, maybe I'll say a couple more things. We can do that so that the ones that are implied, we, again, they're redundant. We don't need them. We throw them away. What we have left, they are pairwise relatively prime. The moduli, now we can solve it. We're done. Okay. So what else? Um, yes. Um, so, um, I, okay. Okay. So here's, I'm not, okay. So I'm not even going to say that these here, let me, let me label these before I get to that one, two, three, Right, four, five. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, there. Are, I think there are a couple of ways you could go about doing this here. Um, I'm just going to tell you one way. Yeah, there's possibly other ways you could th you could mix and match here. Um, so let's look at. Um, Let's look at the fifth congruence, okay? So I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through all the details for how to solve this, but you, I'm going to let you kind of do what you want to do here, but I'm going to just tell you one example of how you can throw some stuff away here. Yes? Uh, by theorem 4.2, part B, you can multiply our fifth equation by theorem 4.2, part B, Um. So yeah, you you the fifth one you can you can multiply by three, but it's not an if and only if because three and six are not relatively prime. So it's not it's not equivalent to it though. You have to be really careful about that. 
Well, here, let me let me show you. Does everybody hang on? Just 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 hang on one second. Does everybody have this down now? Okay. Here, let, let me show you, for example, okay, this is just for example. Um, the uh, the fifth congruence is implied by uh, let's see, what was it? Um, two and three. Okay, so this is just for instance. Um, so remember, congruence 2, if I labeled this right, was uh, what? A is congruent to 2 mod 3, right? And the third one was A is congruent to 2 mod 4, I think. Someone please tell me if I yes. didn't. Okay. So what does this mean? What does this mean? This, this means that 3 divides A minus 2 and 4 divides... A minus 2, right? Now, there's a theorem that we did back in the GCD section, which says that if you have two numbers that both divide the same number and those two numbers are relatively prime, then their product divides it. Right? You guys remember this? So now you know that 12 divides A minus 2. And of course, if 12, if 12 divides it, of course 6 divides it. Right? Because 12 times X is A minus 2, so 6 times 2X is A minus 2. But that just means that A is congruent to 2 mod 6, which is the final congruence, right? You see what I did here? And I already told you that we can also throw away 1, right? It's implied by 3. And if we get rid of 1 and 5, what we have left, they are the moduli are pairwise relatively prime. When we throw away the redundancies, what we have left can be solved with the Chinese remainder theorem. And now are you over it? Yes. <laughs> That's all I have to say about this. Yeah. You guys see what I did here? Okay. So you got to be a little clever sometimes. You got to think about, you know, okay, well, I can't apply the Chinese remainder theorem. Can I do something else first? What can I do? And in this case, this is something that you can do. So. You know, some of these, again, and you know this now being in this course for as long as you've been in this course, some of these things you have to think about. Some of them require some creative problem solving. This is one of those problems. So I've done, I've, I've helped you out now with quite a few of these. You, you have a few left. We can, I can, you know, address a couple, maybe give you a hint or two on Tuesday. But, you know, I've, I've really given you a really good maybe more help than I should have, really. But now you have a lot to go on to finish the homework up. Okay, so I think I'll just go ahead and stop there for today. I want you to think about the, the ones I haven't talked about. Think about them. Work on them, okay? Um, and you'll, like I said, I'm sorry about the homework. You will get the homework back, the graded homework. and It will be graded this time. I'll give that back to you on Tuesday for sure. Okay.